too. Okay. Welcome back to Regen Civics. <laughs> Today we're going to go over tokenomics. Um, Bravo. Yeah. Right. right. Um, and actually wanted to start the discussion of tokenomics today with a counterpoint. Where do we actually need tokens? Um, so before we get into all the places tokens might be useful, I thought it would be helpful to actually give Roberto some space to wax lyrical about why he thinks tokens aren't useful and where they might not be applicable, because um, that's going to help us set the boundary and context of where we're trying to design here. Uh, but before we get into all that, and then I prepared a presentation for tokenomics on a nice mirror board, we can get into it, do it like an overview of what I think are some important questions, and then have a discussion at the end. Um, and if you have any suggestions for changing up the agenda today, just say so in the chat, and of course we can flow and add other things as we go. And of course we'll stop and have spaces for questions along the way and for you to ask anything that you want to know. So before we get in today, is does anyone have any announcements or anything they want to share into the space before we get started? Lauren, hand up, take it away. Uh, at last week's call, we had some Q&A and uh, we brought up some questions and you invited us. You said, okay, great. Finca Sagrada is gonna start off next week. I want you to prepare uh, a little a presentation on where you are, what you know for sure and what your questions are. So I am prepared with a presentation uh, for that today. So wherever it fits. Yes, um, in the context of the token design questions that you guys are having. So initial setup, you're mentioning your questions around, I don't wanna frame you, but it is really helpful if it's along with the tokenomics discussion, um, which I think is a lot of your questions. So yes, we'll start with that and then we'll go over to Roberto and then I'll dive in. Thank you, Lauren, for the reminder. Um, anything else before we get going? And anything else I forgot? Nope. Then with no further ado, we'll go to Lauren. And what she's going to do is she'll set the stage for some questions that Finca Sagrada was having that were triggering the, hey, we need to have a tokenomics discussion. So this will give us some context to what tokenomics is all about. Roberto will give us some more context to where not to use it before I actually get into the presentation and go over tokenomics. So that's where we're headed today. Um, back to you, Lauren. Whoops, hang on, hang on. I got to do this little, the little button here. There we go. Okay. So I will be as brief as possible just to give you guys an overview. Um, so here's what we know, where we are and what we know for sure. Current ownership, Walter and Susan own the property 100%. Uh, they just established a legal structure in Ecuador called Finca Sagrada Retreat Center SAS, which um, in Spanish that translates to something akin to a simplified stock company. And it has a hundred shares. Uh, and that's backed with a thousand dollars, I mean a thousand shares, backed with a thousand dollars. So the land has still not quite been put into that vehicle yet. And we have a lot of questions around that. Um, what we know for sure is spiritual principles will be the foundation of all activities and agreements will be codified into the community bylaws. Preservation of the land as a sacred site is a core objective. The Kogi House of Original Thought is to be maintained. The biodynamic farm is to be maintained. Okay, so our core assumptions are that Finca Sagrada will transition from private ownership to a shared ownership model. The existing land, approximately five hectares of fertile flat land and 271 hectares of mountainside, plus new land, this is where it, is, where it gets a little bit complicated, but it's bear with us, another three and a half hectares of adjacent land that they're in negotiations to purchase. Um, all of that as a, as a total will be put into this simplified stock company. Our phase one goal is, you know, before we get into all the multiple levels of different ways that people can tokenize membership, we need to start with just ownership um, of like who's going to be, you know, the legal uh, agreements and ownership structure for um, those six private residences that are planned to be on the land. And then the phase two goal will be to build a retreat center and develop the community. So our working assumptions are that uh, we're, we're working on attracting six, so five more uh, private residences, uh, all of which will contribute. So Walter and Susan, John and Satya, and four more 
uh, private residences will contribute $500 a month to split the cost to maintain the farm, which is currently about $3,000 a month. And then this is where we have this in quotes. We met with Mark Epstein the other day, and he says, you know, you may want to think about the language and whether you're selling or sharing, and then what these things called building lots are on the land. Um, so he's uh, the working assumption is four of those uh, for fifty thousand dollars each will bring in two hundred thousand dollars. That'll be compensation for him putting the land into the SAS. And additionally, he wants to reserve six additional building lots to be able to sell in the future at market price. Um, and then the rights, I don't wanna go into the weeds too much here. Rights are currently planned as leases in perpetuity. So the ownership will be community ownership. Um, and then you know, by retaining the right to sell these uh, with the building rights, Walter will be paid back his investment. And then these are just basic assumptions that the permanent structures will need to meet community standards. Uh, once built, the structure will stay with the land and belong to the community. Leaseholders, members must meet a set of criteria, which we'll define in the bylaws. Um, shareholders and members will own a number of shares, which is where we're still stuck <laughs> with the rights and responsibilities. Uh, and then they'll have the right to later be able to sell those shares on the quote unquote open market. Um, number of shares will be dependent on the investment and the community will have the right to approve or block incoming members. Um, this is getting way into the weeds, but we've got a, a phase one or stage one, stage two, stage three kind of plan here for uh, which lots will be developed when. Our questions, this is, we have a gazillion questions, but right here are some of the core. How do we distribute and value in some sort of dollars, the ownership shares. What is to be included in the building rights? What percentage of the property should be allocated to the commons? How do we make sure we're fairly compensating Walter and Susan for their land, but while also maintaining a commons treasury? Um, what can heirs legally inherit once the land and ownership is placed in this new legal structure? Can we create new shares that are not tied to the value of the land? And then what if somebody wants to come in and, and do work instead of paying the $500 a month in, um, in splitting those fees? How is that value measured? Uh, lots more details. Um, do Alliance members have examples to share this one here, whoops. Um, so if anybody has examples to share on legal structure and shared ownership models, sample bylaws, et cetera, we'd be wide open for that. What other sources of capital should be we be exploring? Um, I think, uh, yeah, someone on the team put, is there a market for tokens for land regenerative projects? I think that's the, the, the whole presupposition behind this project. Um, and would people donate? Yes, I think they would. It's just a question of how do we structure all of that. So that's that's kind of a quick overview. I'm just going to close with our needs. We need someone to work with Walter and the core team on structuring this, like sitting down and writing this up, developing a phased in business plan or a prosperity plan for the farm. We are also actively recruiting uh, for a biodynamic farmer to take on the role of farm management. We're also looking to do some road improvements and we need the drawings with, you know, more site maps. Uh, and that's it. I'm not going to go into the appendix. Let me stop my share. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Tried to make it as quick as possible. So, so we've been stuck in the mire of like, we have to make these decisions but like this is dependent on this. And before we can get into this, we have to just get that basic ownership structure hashed out in a way so that new investors can come in and say, yes, we wanna buy into this project. We wanna participate. What's the offer? What are the legal agreements and how do we set that up? Thank you for the opportunity to share. Yeah, that was, that was awesome. Um, a million ways to work, uh, and I'm going to try to hone the questions on the, the token model and how that's <clears throat> relevant for today. Um, okay. But before I do that, does anyone have any questions for Lauren or any feedback on what she just shared? Okay. 
could just share Lauren's a great representative for us. I really thank you. <laughs> she puts it all so clearly. I agree. Um, so if I can reframe I, one of your questions, you're asking, you know, how can we account for all the historical contributions to Finca Sagrada? The biggest ones being what Walter and Susan have put in the land and, you know, all of their time, right? Um, and this is one of the main, and I'd say probably only use cases for tokens, which is to track things, to account for things. Um, now, you already kind of did it in the legal entity that you guys set up. You put $1,000 in there and there's 1,000 shares. So we're first doing this with tokens, but you could use the outcome of you doing this with tokens to set up legal shares in a company somewhere if you want to do that later. Right, so what we're doing with tokens right now could later be reflected as shares, and this is how we come up with how many shares we give people when we set up our legal entities. So what I would suggest is you actually go through and say, okay, Walter and Susan, you guys gave $200,000 or whatever it is in land, we're going to give you 200,000 tokens. You put in this many years of work on the project, we're going to give you this much per year. And we're going to give you that many tokens that represent that. So you try to account for all the contributions to the project up to date and then send out tokens that reflect that. Now that could be the ownership of the legal entity that owns the land. So then who owns the land? Well, you own that much percentage of the land because you own the legal entity that owns the land. So that's how other people can come in and start getting a share of the whole project is because they get shares of the legal entity or tokens, which represent shares in this case, um, of the project for all their contributions, if that makes sense. So that's how I would say is the first kind of function of the token is a contribution accounting token. So you just go through and account for all the contributions, that's who gets all the tokens, then you know what percentage everyone owns of the project and the endeavor. Does that help answer that question, Lauren, or what questions would you have on top of that? It helps. I guess, you know, we get, we're still a little stuck on the difference between what's legal, because um, a token right now is, is you know, we're, we're kind of, we're using the, we have the potential here to use the HIFA tools to to put some accounting, some numbers, some, some value on that. But then how does that transition when we have people coming in and, I mean, do we, do we just try to map it over to the existing SAS? And I don't know, it, it, we, we end up spinning and going over the same questions over and over again. It's really frustrating. I, all right, so let me actually bring this up because this is super relevant. So here is our mirror board for today. I'll share with you all it. You can hop in here and play around as well. But let me start off with this, you know, potential token journey. So first step of that token journey, as I would say, is that contribution accounting, which I just described. Then after that step is you do your tokenomics model. You decide what, how we actually want our token to work, which I'll go over today, you know, a flow of trying to figure that one out. And then after that, I say we go through the process of making it legal. And if we find here that we can actually make it legal, then maybe we don't actually build it, <laughs> that we don't launch it. It's just an idea that we have or whatever. But at this stage, after we actually know what our model is, after we've accounted for everything, then we're gonna try to you know, figure out our legal wrappers and see what we can do. And then this is, you know, we might get stuck here. But anyway, this is where I'd say to have those questions answered. But we don't know those questions. We don't know what legal containers we want to use. We don't understand any of this until after we've done our tokenomics model and we actually know what we're trying to build. <laughs> so I'd say don't get stuck on, you know, is any of this legal yet? Because we don't know, because we don't know what you're trying to build yet. Um, and then after that, we build it and then we'll launch it and then we launch our tokens. So what's important from a legal perspective is we're not launching our tokens and having people buy them and put any additional money into them. We're not going into the market and launching these and getting in trouble with any exchanges, you know, securities until after we've made it legit, right? So, so I don't think we have to worry about that legal question until, of course, here when, you know, we're bringing other people into our project. So I'd say that's kind of the roadmap here, and maybe that will be helpful of kind of framing it. Um, so I'd say let's try to stay here for now. Um, the contribution accounting, just to, you know, we've talked about this in previous episodes, so I'm not gonna talk about it anymore here, but here's the template. So you can actually go through, 
You can play with the salary bands of how much you want to pay people. You don't have to use these, but it's just a way of trying to figure out how many tokens people have earned, right? You can put how much voice you want to distribute to if you're doing that differently than you're doing your contribution tokens. Or you can do it the same. And this is how you're deciding who's going to be able to make decisions in your organization. You can set the dollar value or euro value or whatever you want it attached to. So for every dollar worth of contributions, you're giving a token. If you want it to be for every $2 worth of contributions, you get a token, then change this to two. If you want it to be for every 50 cents, then you know, make this 50 cents, right? So this is how much your token is worth, how much you're valuing your token. You set it right here to begin with. And then you go down and you can start adding all the different people, you know, how much they've contributed and you can see what percentage of the company and endeavor that they're gonna hold. So this template helps us get started and let me just make it a little bit smaller. Anyway, I'll share this in the chat too, so you all have it. Um, so to kind of wrap up, I'd say, let's just stay here, stay with the contribution accounting. Let's try to make a full accounting of who's done what um, and reciprocate all the contributions to our project so far. So we know what percentages of the company people are holding. And this is helpful to do regardless of if you're going to do tokens. If you're not going to do tokens at all and you're still just going to do a legal entity, this helps you know how much to, how many shares of that legal entity you're going to issue into whom, right? So this is a useful exercise to do regardless of what your tokenomic model, you know, ends up being, which is why it's step number one. All right. Any questions on that quick kind of roadmap I threw together? Yes, Lauren, go. Well, so you started out with salary bands, and I think that I get hung up on that too because we're starting out with land, you know, and with value of real estate. Um, so would, would you break those into just separate categories? Because at, at first I think we were thinking, how do we just split up the, the percentages of the land ownership and having salary be totally separate? Um, my suggestion and using this model is to not make them separate. Otherwise it's a different class. And then we're creating class societies where we have the landowners who are the ones that own everything and everyone who's working for them. Um, if we did that, then I don't think we really departed from what civilization currently is offering. And then what's the point? <laughs> so, well, but so, so with the salary bands, though, so some people have, have already been being paid in cash, right? They've, they've, been earning certain amounts. So just put that in there as exists now is what you're suggesting? Okay. Um, no, sorry. Uh, the salary band is if they haven't been getting paid. A really simple thing to do with the salary band is if they weren't getting paid 190K, but you thought that was going to be equitable, but they were getting paid. And we're not paid. anywhere near those numbers, by the way. 190K a, is like, wait, what? They're, they're just numbers. <laughs> we're in Ecuador. Make them whatever you want them to be. Um, yeah. That's just to try to help it make it really easy to account for all the things that are difficult. We just gave it a salary and said, okay, if you're a half time, here's your salary. I'd say subtract anything that was already paid out. So if they've already been paid 30,000, then just subtract it because that's already been accounted for. Okay. But that's so we how can... everything balances is if a, you know, a dollar investment has already come in, you account for that for giving them a token. That dollar goes to pay for someone, then that contribution was already accounted for. They already got a dollar. So you don't need to send them a token. Tokens are just there to account for the things that haven't already been accounted for. So if people have already been paid, great. You know, you don't need to account for those things, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a little difficult because we have three workers, they get paid cash. Um, they're not really part of this and it comes out of our pocket. So I, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't include them. I'd only include people you are considering to be members. So people who'd also be like governing with the project, you know, who want to participate in this, who want to have tokens, et cetera. Um, I'd say I'd look at the other people as contractors instead of members, and you're just paying them for a service and that exists outside of the, the exercises we're doing here. Um, these exercises is more for you, Lauren. You've been doing a lot of stuff. Has it been tracked for yet? Maybe, maybe not. You know, this is a way of accounting for all the work you're doing for the project right now. Um, and except for everyone who's doing their projects and why this is the very first thing is because all the other steps is going to take a lot of time. <laughs> so we want to account for the people who are actually going through the process of designing our token economies, launching these tools, etc. Like 
that's effort in order to get people to want to like show up and really do that effort. They probably want to be seen and appreciated. This is why we start with the, you know, tracking the contributions so people can show up and start, you know, doing stuff. Can I come in, Reiki? Sure. Uh, there's a few things here I think that would be good to think through. The first one is there needs to be an agreement of what the community is going to be and how the community is going to be operating as a community, it appears to me, before you could have people buy into being part of the community. And so that becomes an essential you know, prior thing. Otherwise, you're just doing a business transaction activity and there's no level of commitment to the co-creation of something together. So I suspect- I accounted for that in my presentation that all of the spiritual principles and the community principles would be codified into the bylaws. So I okay. just- yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's essential because you don't it want is. people in your community who don't, haven't made the joint commitment to all of that. The second thing is that, uh, you know, there's kind of two ways to deal with the land. I've been very involved with building community land trusts for many years. And you can either have all the land owned collectively in like a nonprofit organization with the idea that you're working to get the land out of being paid over and over again by people with the banks making all the money all the time. So you take the land out of the ownership activity, which is a wonderful good thing for do, to do for humanity. Or, and, and then everybody who has a house on the land or whatever, owns their house. And then part of the agree, community agreements is that all the, there's a, yeah, and you, you, you allowed for these and one of the, the, some of the things you created, you presented, uh, Lauren, that, you know, there's restrictions on who, you, who can buy the house and become part of the community because the community dominates, not the sale of land. Uh, there's two ways to do community land trusts. You can have the land owned collectively, as I've described in the property, the houses, et cetera, owned separately within the community construct. The other way is to have both the houses and the land owned, and that would be a second way to do it. What I'm trying to describe here is a way that you could put the whole foundation of it together so that you could then build out from being a community rather than building out from having people get tokens for work as the, as the primary thing. Does that make sense, Reiki, to, to what you've been thinking? Um, sure, yeah. Okay. I mean, the answer is probably way longer than that, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Lauren, was that helpful? And, and, and uh, Susan and Walter, was that helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did just want to parrot what you're saying, Terry. Um, absolutely. Uh, we want to make sure that people understand what they're buying into, agreeing to before they, we offer that, which is why the launch your tokens, you know, exists after we design our model and after, of course, we build it, right? And okay. we make it legit and legal. So that's kind of the process we're going through is first we start accounting for the contributions that we're making that everyone else is making who's gonna be able to take us on this journey. Like, let's start doing that because that's the foundation. Um, that's not why you're doing it, probably. Um, the tokens are just, again, it's to track things. All we're doing is we're keeping account, we're keeping a store of the activity that's happened in our community. Tokens are one of the ways of many that we can do that. Um, I do wanna set that context that tokens aren't the everything here. Um, and we'll talk about this in later episodes when we get into project org economics, you know, like organization economics. This is where we have roles and badges and quests and all sorts of things that may or may not even require tokens in order to operate. Um, and that's where we can make other agreements. So anyway, we can get further. So let's not get, you know, shoehorned into this idea of tokens. It's not the end of the story here. Tokens are just a way that we can account for things that haven't been accounted for historically. Um, and that's how we can start making things more equitable and more transparent, which is what we're trying to do. Um, Terry, anything else before we move on to there's another hand that was just up, I just went down. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I forgot to bring my hand down. Yep. Um, any other questions? Cool. Um, Lauren, we could probably get in a little bit deeper on a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm happy to do that with you guys. But again, what I just highly recommend to start with is just get an accounting for the things that haven't been accounted for yet. 
so that the people showing up as part of your core team who's launching this project all feel seen, that their shares have been you know, established, that there's a clear agreement for why and how they're gonna be seen going forward. So maybe that's tokens, maybe it's something else, but it's just an agreement for how the core team right now is operating because that team is gonna be required to build out the rest of your organization and scale this, right? Um, Jillian, got your hand up. Yeah, just wanted to say uh, thanks, Lauren. You really rock. And I don't know if you heard me saying that earlier. Um, and I think there's so much here in terms of the intentional communities and eco-village movement that have been working with these questions for a long time. So I think now that we're meeting um, tokenization, let's remember that there's been a lot of people trying to figure this out before these kind of tokens came in. Um, and so, I mean, my my brain bank is firing, having been involved with eco communities for over 30 years. But I think that there's may, maybe ways we can make uh, deeper bridges into those communities and maybe I can help to facilitate that. And I'm still with this meme of this is the first season and how can we continue to develop this literacy and to shape this type of uh, a program or experience or learning or education. Um, and that's part of, you know, kind of where I'm, where I'm coming from around this, but, um, and I'm also very interested in, in particularly finding out more about your project. And I've been uh, kind of called to come down that way for a long time, but I think that maybe also us physically moving around would be good. But short of that, I think that if you were to do a one-on-one -on -one with them, um, Reiki, it might be good to at least maybe fishbowl it with other people being able to be present because I think that these meetings that we're in here are kind of too short to really get into the nitty-gritty and now that the arc of what we're doing is moving more into the nitty-gritty I think we need to have quality time to be able to do that um, and have those processes together so diversifying our you know our meeting types and times thank you yep I, I love that upgrade, Jillian. So what I was going to do was have some of the, pro the season facilitators just do one-on-one -on -one calls with projects, but now I actually think it'd be cooler if the facilitator held space for anyone to show up and ask that project questions too. Um, so we have 13 projects that'll take 13 weeks to do this. So we'll have one project share each week. Um, it'll kind of be the spotlight that week. And then anyone can attend and talk to that project. I do want to give a couple more weeks before we start those so that projects have a little bit more foundation that we've worked through uh, to be able to share in those calls and provide people so that they're as valuable as they can be. Um, but if a project feels particularly ready right now, then share with me right now and we can set one up with you next week so we can actually get going. Um, <clears throat> cool. Thanks, Jillian. Anything else that anyone would like to add? Then, oh, Letty, and then after that, we'll send it over to Roberto, because this is probably a good transition to talk into places where tokens aren't useful um, before we get into talking about where places tokens are useful. So, Letty. Yes, then... it's like building up this last idea of having these uh, transversal groups inside region civics or transversal to the organization's projects. Maybe we can coordinate some kind of working groups inside the Alliance. So, because we are working in very similar things, but there is not like this collaboration realm happening, not on the ground, not online, not on the project. So maybe that's, there was this community project uh, working group we were doing. So maybe that's useful to replicate one for tokenomics, one for community or legal, just as you are like uh, organizing real civics, it's a DH already. So we can just fractalize that inside the Alliance and say, okay, if I'm working towards this. Maybe we need these uh, groups with the Alliance going forward and not just isolating the projects for one week because that's useful as a presentation but not for working inside the, the projects. So that's my suggestion, doing working groups, yeah. I love that. And we have a space in our Discord now, here we go, uh, for working groups right here under season one flow stream. So if you have another working group you'd like to add, come in here, tag Neil, say what you'd like to add and or you'd get given the powers to be able to add it yourself. So season one, working groups, you can put up all the ideas. Um, any other things to share? 
then I will pass it over to Roberto. And you can maybe just give a few thoughts before we keep going. Yeah, so I think that uh, it's a good question where is token uh, needed and where, where it's not. And uh, for us, it's very clear that there are situations where it's actually counterintuitive or counterproductive. I, before uh, we get into it, I think like uh, I think the function of a token or or tokenomics in general is uh, to carry information, right? So when we're talking about like okay contribution, and we assign a token, we can say okay we want to track that information that somebody has been contributing. Um, maybe our struggle because we have different kind of like setup. Uh, and, and it requires this different kind of tokenomics in a way. In um, imagine that uh, you have your plot inside a commune, and uh, and somebody comes and help you water the plants or do something. Um, if we that information is valuable, somebody help me out. But if we attach that information to the value of your own property. Uh, you might actually, or of your own plot, you might actually think like, hmm, is this, is, is this a gesture for, is a gift? Or is this so that uh, um, value is actually being taken? So I think the, in the idea of war, in the idea of community, it's, there is a lot of sharing and a lot of gifting. And I'm afraid that when, well, the fact that you're around here, it's uh, um, it's it's not to help out this community, but to take a piece of this community. So, um, we have, we, what I'm saying is that we should be a little bit careful there. Um, there are those new situations in which, like, completely new activities are being started, and maybe that's actually a good idea, right? So, uh, in the situation we have. All, all of the above, we have like a, a private properties that are being given access to a network. Uh, and this is kind of like community exchange. Then there is like a, a commons place that is owned by the network and everybody within the network just simply contributes. And then there is a new place where um, it's now privately owned, but there is a lot of work to do. And there maybe we can use the, the same, more or less the same kind of tokenomics that Lauren uh, uh, showed. So I don't, the, our difficulties is actually to find something that brings them all together. So I would like, for instance, to think that in this third place where we can actually do the whole kind of like your contribution is attached to the value of the place completely. So we're gonna account for how much did it cost uh, for the time you spend watering all the plants? If we actually, we can take that and exchange it with a token over here, but it's a different kind of token. It's maybe an access token or, so we know that you've spent some yeah. token over there, you've contributed over there. And because of your contribution, you're welcome over here, but it's a different kind of deal, right? When you're over here. It's not that if you if you contribute over here, you're actually going to get the same thing. So the complexity of this kind of ecosystem of tokenomics is what really is kind of getting us into trouble. And uh, and uh, yeah, so we're actually wondering if you should focus on one of these or we should still try to manage with the dynamics of the ecosystem. I'll pass it back for questions and uh, conversation. Ooh, um, I'll do my responding during my presentation. So does anyone else have any thoughts they want to share and bring to Robert or bring to this discussion? I would just like to say I agree um, in that it, it just feels appropriate to have <clears throat> different, like different layers of, of tokenomics, like the, the People who buy in and live there and uh, have rights, uh, you know, leasing rights on the property, 
that's one level of, of energy exchange. And then a, a separate level that is not, it feels like to me, it should not be attached to those rights should be working and con contributing and energy exchange. And is there a way to, to have those in separate tiers? That's because otherwise it just gets tangled up and, and we don't get anywhere. <laughs> Um, I would say less tiers, more boundaries, borders. You know, for example, stomach acid is really important to have in the stomach. It's not what you want in the liver. It's not what you want in the lungs, <laughs> you know. So you, know, you don't want to employ tokens in areas where they wouldn't cause, you know, they might cause harm. Um, so I'd actually look at them as more boundaries. And here's just a really super rough sketch. You know, you can have the outermost boundary that's token facilitated. You know, within that, you have a closer boundary where there's more trust. And that's just facilitated by roles. So, for example, you're doing like a Ubuntu contributionism society where everything is free as long as you provide three hours of work or whatever it is. So if you have that role, meaning you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, then everything's provided for you. You don't have to account for every food item you purchase with a token, right? But then within you know, a tighter community, you might just be trust. You've moved beyond that. Within your family kinship, you don't want to track things with your kids. You know, some weird capitalists like doing that, but you, know, you don't need to do that, right? And then within a tighter group, you know, as we mature or as we create different boundaries, each one of these boundaries are going to be smaller, likely. Um, a smaller number of people participating in them. Not always. Um, so this is how I'd start thinking because you have the same thing for membership. So likely depending on where you're at with that membership process depends on you know, what type of economy you're most engaged with. Because it's very likely that if you are you know, one of the projects that are creating a speculative token, it might be that tens of thousands of people are speculating on the price of your project and you don't know any of these people. They're not eating food from your trees. They're not doing any of that, right? So they would be in the outmost community if that's a, you know, an idea for your community, right? Um, and that would all be intermediated with tokens. You wouldn't need to vote them into a role in order for them to you know, speculate on your project. So anyway, I'd say a really healthy model to kind of look at is just grab these concentric circles. Just think of a few, if you're already seeing this, boundaries that you might have. Again, try not to overcomplicate things. But you know, we are designing ecosystems here, so they're going to be complex. And there's no way around that. Um, the only way around it is to really increase our thinking. So we need to get healthier, <laughs> we need to keep showing up, and our thoughts are going to increase in speed, and then we're going to handle more complexity. But we're not going to be able to, you know, simplify this down because we're building ecosystems and it requires that level of complexity. Um, so anyway, all that being said, I'd just say start here with a little simple model like this. Um, Letty, you have your hands up. If there's any other thoughts, please put your hand up. Yes, I just want to contribute to this. Uh, I think it was like a question about how to really coordinate the legal, the economics or economic systems and just to make it like work for every region. And I just came from a refi presentation. So I have like these principles very clear right now. And I want to express like this first principles thinking because I think it's useful for everyone to, to be able to, to, to innovate in their way of approaching this kind of economics because for example, all this is interconnected. Every single <clears throat> legal system you can think of the world can be like replicated in a legal system with other jurisdictions. And the economics or the tokenomics you want to implement in any trust or foundation or NGO or a community association being private or public, we can think about tokenomics like these economic principles embedded in the uh, general container, right? So I would like explore us having like these roles and circles because some of them may not be like super centric in the organization. So you can maybe create a community land trust and say, okay, many people or the core team are gonna have this badge uh, and they are like co-op members or stigma. So they can have their own tokenomics and that will be like more uh, related to salaries or compensation or distributions. But then you can think about the general community. So maybe you have like a farm or you're producing things. So you say, okay, but maybe people want here to distribute between each other the products. So they will be like a general community within your community. And that's a different tokenomic level. And you could think of them like interacting or distributing, 
right? So, so I think like this role system can give us a different way to think about how we will be distributing our eight forms of capital. Remember, it's not only monetary or financial, experiential, legal, uh, cultural, uh, all these eight forms, right? Which I will be just good try to do, but it's experimental. And I would advise from the very beginning not to think only in terms of US jurisdictions for this land trust, because I see we are having Latin communities, communities in Europe. So maybe in some cases, it will make sense to have this US entity levels, but in other cases, it won't make sense to have those. But that doesn't mean like these entities cannot interrelate with each other if we make those agreements too. So that would be my thing, like innovate, but be also open to this kind of other uh, regions and other ways of interacting with the uh, members of your communities. And it all can be condensed in this systems thinking. Like there are different levels, but those are transversal well systems. Um, fully agree. And uh, does anyone else have any reflections for Letty or anything else to share before I dive into? tokenomics presentation. Um, Gabriel. Hi folks, uh, apologies for background noise. I'm in Panama City at the moment. Um, really appreciate the conversation, the questions, uh, and it's a personal challenge as well because I'm looking to start a land there myself in the near future, wrestling with the ideas of tokenomics. One question I've got, um, relating to the idea of ownership versus shared governance or stewardship is can tokens uh, such as in the HIFA system um, be reassignable to new participants or stakeholders or can they be, is there a form of token that can be taken away from by governance group consensus from an individual for breaking the boundaries, becoming the stomach acid in the lungs, for example, um, or leaving the property and therefore not warranting carrying the benefit of a, a particular token, whether it be economic value or access rights, if they are not any longer present to be governors or contributors to the land, Therefore, the rest of the community can, can take back that token and then assign it to a new governor or steward. Um, I love the, the depth and breadth of wisdom in this group and the questions and things you guys are all bringing. So nothing small ever brought to the table. Um, so a quick response to Letty on eight forms of capital, absolutely, and nine forms potentially. A quick response to Gabriel before we get going. Um, yeah, there's two philosophical camps with tokens. You know, one is that a token can never be removed from somebody. So kind of like Bitcoin, your keys, your crypto. Um, no one should ever be able to take this for any reason whatsoever. And there's not even a potential for them to be able to do that. You know, the other side, which is what we're seeing in some DAOs where governance rules, um, the tokens can be moved around and they can be readjusted. So that is kind of a, it's a governance question, less tokenomics when we're getting into our system, um, because the governance controls the tokenomics. It controls whether you're just going to create an entirely new token and make the old one obsolete. You know, so that is something to keep in mind, but that's a whole other chapter where we get into governance, uh, I think, in order to really answer that question. Um, and the decisions needed to be made as we start going down the governance rabbit hole. Um, but maybe that's just something to just be aware of when we're talking about tokens, that depending on which branch you want to go down, tokenomics are evolvable. So they're there to keep track of things, to keep account. But they're not something that are potentially immutable. They could be changed. They could be rewritten. You know, as we're learning, you can adjust history. You know, all of that can happen. But what's interesting with tokens and blockchain is that history is always stored. So you can never destroy history. You can just you know, change current reality and change the course of history. Um, so that's one camp. And the other one is we never change tokens. They land where they land and it's exactly how it should be. So anyway, I 
I question groups to maybe have to make that decision at some point with their tokens, um, because it's also going to represent how you pitch your tokens to investors and anyone else. Because if the tokenomics can be completely rewritten through governance, then investors have a really important interest in what's going on in governance, because maybe their tokens can just be taken away or whatever, right? So that's why I bring this up, because you're going to need to know this in order to design your tokens, in order to know what they're really actually worth, whether or not, you know, history can be rewritten, if that makes sense. Um, but I think that might be getting too much into the weeds. <laughs> so, so I appreciate the question, Gabrielle, and we'll definitely get deeper into that in governance when, when that chapter comes up. Um, Charles, if you have a question directly related to tokenomics, great. If not, I'm going to dive into that. So I'll pass it to you if you have something. Uh, yeah, I would like to say uh, that the the sort of approach that goes on in my mind to the developing token set for a community like Finca Socrat or, or someone like that is that uh, it may be helpful to start by concentrating on the, on the bylaws, which are basically saying what we want to do about value and recognition and so on without focusing on how it's represented in tokens. Imagine that you were keeping ledgers in the central office of who contributed what to when and so on. Uh, and uh, imagine what happens when someone joins the community and leaves the community and don't even think about tokens at that point. And then once you have a fairly good idea of how you want those flows and things to work, why then you can sit down and implement that in a token system. You know, that you really want to drive the development of the token set from the community understanding and agreement rather than say, well, here's a bunch of things that tokens can can do. Let's see how we can fit them into our community goals. So I'm just suggesting that that's another way to to approach the problem as uh, as that. Absolutely. I'd like to weave that way into the the other way, the other other way, so the same way. Um, by what's being oops, suggested here in the potential token journey is that the design your tokenomics model is where I'd say that's 100% where that's happening. And maybe you don't even have a token. So really, this should actually just be design your economics model. And maybe you need tokens for it, or maybe you don't. Um, but what I always want, I'm just encouraging just to simplify things and get people started is we're still doing the contribution accounting before that so that you're accounting for the people who are helping build the model. And then afterwards, if you decide you don't want to use that accounting template, fine. But at least you have a history of who's done what until that point, and you can use that to inform your decisions going forward. Um, but then that just gives a, a base agreement to get started from so that you're not doing what Lauren you're sh you know, sharing about doing where you're just you know, spinning your wheels over because you don't know how to get started. This is saying you, know, you can get started doing it this way. Um, and then another high level way of looking at this is tokens have a claim for something, maybe. So first, if they have no claim, then say that and make it really clear and explicit anytime anyone's interacting with these tokens that they're experimental, they mean nothing. You know, maybe people are paying money for these, but they're collectibles or whatever it is, right? So if they have no you know, legal claim out there, make sure that's explicit. Because at the end of the day, we're building new economies here, but it's really just about people being on the same page. So people show up thinking they're buying, you know, one token, but it turns out to be something else. That's where all the lawsuits happen, right? So what we want to do is just be clear and transparent with what we're doing here. So that's what these claims and disclaimers are for. You could have legal claims. So if you're attaching it to a, you know, a DAO LLC, for example, and your tokens do represent shares, and you decide to do that when you're in the make it legit stage, um, then great. Those tokens have legal claims now. Maybe they don't start that way because you don't know yet when you're doing your contribution accounting. But when you get to this stage, you're like, yep, we want to make it, but these are shares. Great. Now your tokens have legal claims. Um, maybe they don't have any legal claims. They have digital claims. So this is what DAOs are really all about is, you know, through smart contracts, you can say your token 
guarantees you to do X, Y, Z or something else in the digital world, you know? So for example, I should be able to take this, you know, for example, I could take this token and it gives me a digital claim to another token. So maybe the project is holding Ethereum tokens and your project token can always come back to the project and claim Ethereum tokens for, you know, holding your token. Great, so now your token has digital claims where people can use your token and go claim something else with it. Or it could have cultural claims. So this is just agreements in your community. So you as a community can say, if you're holding this token, that means you get to sleep in this you know, room, in this dormitory. That means you get to steward this land, you know, and you get to have access to this acre of property. You get to have access to this house. Or maybe when you're in this culture, if you have this token, you can use it to buy food or whatever. So cultural claims could be anything. This is when you can start attaching through making agreements as a community, all the different things you want your tokens to do. So this is really kind of what tokens can do is they have claims for things is one way of looking at them. So you can start them off, no claims at all. All these are doing is tracking contributions. So there's no rights here. All we're doing is just trying to figure out who owns what, who's done what. You know, you can start that way and then you can add more stuff as you go if you choose to, right? Um, any pa I'll pause there if there's any questions on that before I work through this. And for those who are looking for this, the whole tokenomics area, it's over here. And just FYI, I'm going to start doing this now for these calls. I think this is great. So for each one of these oops, areas that we're really diving into each episode, I can create a little spot on the near, mirror board where we can track all the information. And then our whole journey can just be in one big awesome board. So that's kind of where we're headed here. Um, John, you got your hand up. And then I'll design into this. Uh, yeah. Um, so you talked about um, doing the tokenomics first and then setting up the, the legal structure. Um, so uh, at some point, you know, um, we have to talk about um, what legal structures make some of those claims uh, valid in whatever jurisdictions you're in. So if you're talking about a token gives you claim to a land, <clears throat> um, at some point, we have to have in the background this idea of what if we all need to trade it in and we need to divvy it up and you know it's, it doesn't doesn't work. How how do we make sure that the claims that are represented on the tokens are valid, recognized, and enforceable in the jurisdictions in which we're we're operating? Or are sure. we thinking um, we're, re we're really separating and we're not going to pay any attention to that? Definitely, we are paying attention to that, just not right now because we have to go in order. Um, so before we know what legal entities we even want to use, we want to know what we're trying to build first. Um, so this is kind of like putting the cart before the horse. If you're shoehorning yourself into one particular legal entity style for whatever reason that could be problematic as we're discovering right now there's a plethora of different types of legal structures for a whole bunch of different things uh, multinationals know this and they employ a whole bunch of different legal structures depending on what they're trying to accomplish so that's why you know the legal entity is after we do the economics model but absolutely if you're making a legal claim and that's going to be for land so land is always a legal claim right who gets to you know, enforce land ownership? Well, the old world laws. So you have to use the old world in order to make that claim. So that's definitely a legal claim. And then you'd have to use an, you know, a legal structure that allows for that, right? Um, but you decide right here if that's what you actually wanna build first before you go ahead and build it, right? So as we're designing our economics, we'll decide, yeah, do we want a land back token or not? If yes, then we know we need to use a legal structure in our next step that's gonna be able to design that, right? or you know connect that great thanks but thanks. yeah the make it legit that's an entire chapter that comes next right now we're still trying to figure out what we're building right <laughs> and then after we do that we'll make it legit then we'll make sure we have it we'll polish it we'll you know get it all ready for new people to join and then that's when the crowd pooling will be where we actually go out there and have people contribute to our projects and start buying this token and put it into life right um so of course that comes after we make it legit but Anyhow, so 
So let's try to stick to this short roadmap because otherwise we're going to keep going in circles. Um, unless someone has a completely different way of approaching this roadmap, then of course, let me know. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, any right other? Here. I feel like we, yeah, right. Excuse me. Yes. Um, yeah, honestly, I feel like we are going in circles. We do have the absolute best legal structure. Um, I don't think anyone here has disputed that the 508C1A is the gold standard for sovereignty. Um, we absolutely, I don't think there's zero unclarity in my mind as to whether uh, we're doing a land-based project and whether we have the need for the most sovereign legal container. Um, I think you kind of seem to be talking circles around this. Like, let's let's move this forward. The universe is the structure. Um, does any anyone feel free to chime in if there's a better structure that we're not aware of? <laughs> well, um, I'd, so, so for let's, the alliance, let's not beat around the bush. It's not as far as the best DAO tooling. I, I'm just not ashamed to to, uh, to say that that like Haifa is the DAO tooling we want to use. I think some of the spinning of our wheels is. Uh, is from us in the group and specifically you not being willing to step up and use the best tools we have available. Sometimes the discussion can go on endlessly and there's times that we decide to make action. And this has been six months talking about getting funding together. And, and honestly, I don't necessarily feel much closer to that because the legal structure that we've spent years working on bringing to this group hasn't really been addressed. Uh, it's, uh, let's just make it clear that we're working with the best here. And um, so I just want to speak up because obviously this is a non-dogmatic container and Reich is approaching it in a way that's saying these are all the different options so everyone can make their own sovereign choice and I respect, I respect you for doing it that way. Um, I just want to say that from hearing Lauren say that she's still concerned and confused about legal and what's right and what, what's not right, it, it does bring me some frustration because I do want people to realize that they have the freedom to create tokens and NFTs that are backed by land and assets and securities without regulation, provided that it's a private membership association, which can be a private society or a, or a PCA or a land trust or a spiritual ministry. So it's not necessarily saying this is the way and the only way, and which is kind of what Stephen's alluding to right now, although that does help, you know, as, a, as an alliance to make a decision and say, okay, this is the best legal structure, this is the best DAO, these are the things that we're going to use moving forward. Do we agree? Yes. Okay. So we don't have to keep having these conversations and, and going around in circles. We just make a decision. Um, that's what Stephen's saying. Um, but I respect your way, Reiki. And yes, we're just an Alliance member and we're not here to say this is what everyone needs to do. Um, okay. Is that fair? All right. Yeah. Back to you, Reiki. <laughs> All right. Um. So as a quick response, just kind of a, a general principle for the Alliance, um, regeneration is about diversity for a practical reason too, because if we use one legal structure and then for whatever reason, the nation state that controls that legal structure changes their opinions about it, which is pretty easy for them to do, that could be a complete game stopper for our whole movement if everything is paced and predicated on that one legal system. The same is true for DAO tooling. So that's why we're not saying one DAO tooling is necessarily better because we don't know. There could be bugs in that. You know, there's a million things that can go wrong with one particular tool set. So regeneration is about creating diversity and the things that are really important so that they become more resilient as an ecosystem. So that if one of our tools falters, it doesn't disrupt our entire thing and what we've got going on so here. So what other DAO tooling do you recommend than, than the one that you've been pouring your, <clears throat> pouring your life force and energy and money into for the last four years. Is, is there another favorite you have, two or three we should talk about, or um, do we really just have one favorite? I'm not spending enough time in other places to have my own favorite. I have my favorite, but I think well, other why, why, ones would be really great. Let's to speak use. it. I, I have my favorite too. But now I we're going back. Same as yours. So look, does anyone else have any Dow tooling they recommend over Hyphus? Because if not, let's not let's not beat around the bush. I, mean, saying, yeah. I do. I recommend Celesta Labs. We're using it for Regen Garden and we love it. I've been waiting to get on Haifa, but I haven't been able to yet because I think there's a long list of people who want to get on there. So. And as an alliance, I think you'd Definitely be able to play with other, other options. But. Um, but we'll pass the hand to Tucker and we'll keep. Actually, I don't, I don't want to move on. Is there anything else, Will and Stephen, that you want to share? 
uh, maybe we need to have a little breakout sesh on on DAO tooling so we can kind of get to the bottom of what we like and don't like about future DAO tooling, what's going to empower us to move into the new future age, and which tools we uh, endorse within our alliance. Um, yeah, because I'm I, I, I'm tired of the slow pace this is moving. Honestly, um, I'm ready to speed this up. And when we have clear decisions made on things that are working for us, uh, I don't like to beat around the bush and wait and ask other people if they have other possible alternatives when it's very clear that, that the ec economists and, and the DAO experts have spoken. I hear you. I hear your desire to move things forward in that domain and I'm with you. Um, Thanks. The other thing is uh, I have a favorite, script, a I have a favorite on... cryptocurrency too. It's, it's <laughs> okay. seeds. And that's, that's the other thing. This is all based out of one, one regenerative cryptocurrency and and uh, unless anyone has any other favorites, you know, I, I, that's the other thing in this group that if we're going to be all kind of co-creating something together, I, I am for using the best options available. But I, I only know of one wallet like Seeds that, that works to let us send transactions to each other with zero fees, easy non-KYC access, all the, thing, all the reasons that we believe in these things. And uh, I think solidifying some of these between the group instead of discussing the plentiful option that may exist in the future of the regenerative world there isn't for ikea there, there's the seeds wallet there's there's two or three other attempts and they all they're floundering compared to seeds wallet um so i i'd like to kind of decide what we're using and uh and all get on the same page that hopefully thanks <laughs> thank you um everything i will share with tokenomics by the way is possible with those tools uh, I don't know if it's possible with other tool sets I'm less familiar with. Um, I'm only one human, so I can only see so much. But everything I'm presenting as far as tokenomics designs are you're capable of doing them with the do tool, the seeds wallet, and the economy, and all the tools that we've already built within seeds and Haifa and those movements. Um, putting a cap on this, though, what I'd suggest for the alliance going forward, actually, is that we'll have our own... Uh, fork branches or whatever you want of all the tools we want to use. So they will be alliance kind of centric. And that's what the first alliance partners are bringing to the alliance is their tool sets, open sourcing them, integrating them. And then we'll have our own, you know, tool ecosystem that we are using and building. Um, but that's going to take some time as all of this. So anyway, Tucker, you got your hand up before we dive in. And then Julian. I just wanted to, um, reiterate the talk on the, the legal structure for a, a short moment. Um, as, as far as like what's legal for tokenomics, I believe the general consensus isn't necessarily around one specific legal entity, but just keeping it in the private. And I bring this up because it is important. I know there's a lot of people considering putting land into specific entities right now. And even though it is down the road in this whole regen civics um, roadmap, I, I think it's important to note that private is the way to go because if you keep it out of the jurisdiction of the courts, they really have nothing to say about it. And that can be done through a land trust, a private members association, a 508. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do it, but private is kind of the general consensus. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. And um, there's been a governance working group that's been working together. Tucker, you've been throwing those together. So I know there's been a lot of discussion around this. Um, so if you do have any questions, then definitely reach out to Will or Steven or Tucker. I think there's a few others too that have like really gone down the rabbit hole here. Um, so when we're making a decision, I don't know if we ever do that as an alliance and kind of force that onto projects, but definitely as a project, feel free to make a decision. Um, and move forward and let's not hamstring ourselves by the, anyway, we get that Jillian, please go. Yeah, I had my hand up and down a couple of times, but I, I do want to honor Stephen for speaking up. And there's, I think there's honoring of the Yang that's ready to move. And I think um, any tension that we feel really is an indicator of there's something in the system that we need to design for. And I think one of the, the meta things is we have very different projects at very different stages of the process. And, you know, I've been, since I showed Roberto the, the permaculture zones last fall, we've been using it a lot. And there might've be people who are like in zone zero and just ready to rock. Uh, people who are in zone one that are pretty close to that and, and so on and so forth. And I think that, again, this is the first run through 
how can anything that we come up with individually, what we feel, what we think, be brought forward constructively um, towards shaping not only what we're going through now, but for the future. And I don't mean that in any way for um, Stephen to say you, you shouldn't speak, because I think that there is like, especially for me as an elder woman that has been in community for a long time, there is something very needed in terms of the male being ready to go. Um, and we need to contextualize that in balance. So I want that to be honored. And you're Reiki, an example of the male that's ready to go. And sometimes I think this is what I've been wanting to talk to you about is just the contextualization of where are we in the process? Um, and being a teacher, an educator, a curriculum designer, a big part of what we're doing is developing curriculum, if you will, as we're, you know, we're pulling our boots on while we're walking. So I just wanted to say, you know, all of us are probably feeling something or some things and encourage us to get into it. Feel, talk amongst yourself and how can we bring that energy constructively moving forward? And again, honoring the energy of people who are leading us and those of us who are following and hopefully will come more and more into leadership. You know, I am uh, both ready to go, but I also don't completely understand what the fuck we're doing. So, you know, I'm in that, that balance point. And I think that probably applies to more than just me. Thank you, Jillian. Um, here's what I can offer based on what I'm trying, I think I'm hearing. Um, one, I'm gonna keep playing a facilitator role that is unbiased and not dogmatic to hold space for the things we don't know and for us to keep exploring this world together. So what are we doing each week? We're diving through the complexity of designing these systems. We're on a learning journey. Um, I don't know if we're tracking necessarily progress towards a particular goal each week. The progress is the expansion of our understanding, uh, the clarity around the systems we're building and moving forward towards you know, more understanding of what we're actually creating. You know, I think that's kind of the, the progress indicator for these sessions, um, unless, you know, have we got to a fundraising point yet? Because if we try to rush that, we're just going to keep spinning our wheels. Um, and then we're going to get stuck in a seven year journey of, you know, running a project that's not designed well enough. Um, so that's my bias and how I'm approaching this. So yes, I'm ready to rock. I get that. I understand the energy. I want to move. Um, so with all of that being said, I did want to dive into tokenomics so that we can actually pick a model. <laughs> um, but now we've done our you know usual call time. So two ways we can handle this. I can deliver the information at the end of this call, and then we can consider it and then dive into it next week. Or we can just keep going around with the hands up, keep the dialogue going, and then start tokenomics next week. So if you want to hear tokenomics right now, before we end today's session, give me a heart. Um, if you would like to just keep going with the conversation and then talk to economics next week, give a thumbs up. All right, I see a bunch of hearts. Um, then I will just quickly dive in with tokenomics. We'll expand more on this next week. So we'll be a little bit of both because there's a lot to go over, but let me just give you a quick rundown. All right, so where are tokens useful? What do you want a token for? What are you trying to accomplish? So here's just some like thought forms around what tokens are actually good for. Um, you know, you're trying to raise funds and you believe tokens can be a good way to do that within your jurisdiction, great. You want to create a new economic system and we think that using tokens badges and roles is a good way of creating one and we'll use tokens to track value flows in our community right um, we want to make a circular economic system and we want to make sure value doesn't leak so we track value with tokens and then we institute ways that we prevent leaking of value from our community and we hold things in right um, or we want a new currency because national currencies keep losing value and we are tired of being subjected to, you know, boom and bust cycles, depressions and recessions and all this crap, and we'd rather have our own stable economies. So we might use tokens to facilitate that. Um, you know, we want to use tokens to reciprocate contributions so that everyone can equitably contribute, equitably contribute and show up to a project and be seen without us needing to deplete our treasury to do that. Or moreover, without us first needing to get permission from financiers in order to start collaborating. Because in a lot of our projects, there might actually already be landowners who want to contribute land and builders who want to build and permaculturists who want to plant, et cetera, and who don't need money in order to do that. So we can get started building our projects 
without first having to get permission from people with money in order to start coordinating, which is really one way of looking at this, especially in the context today of us going into a recession, a depression, which in a lot of cases just means there's not enough money to go around. It's not like everyone suddenly got sick and died or factories burned down or any of that. It's just a economic situation where there's not enough money to go around to mediate interactions. So if we get rid of that requirement for money by using tokens instead, then we can start coordinating to accomplish the stuff we wanna do a lot quicker. So these are some of the ways we might wanna use tokens to assist us in our economy building. You know, what powers do tokens give our movement? You know, one uh, I like to start off is, you know, reduced legal fees, because there's a lot of things that you can do with a token and a DAO that would be really expensive to do in a legal environment. So, for example, if you are setting up a legal DAO or a, a DAO LLC, then you kind of have the best of both worlds, because then you can just use tokens as if they are shares. Um, but the parallel is the stuff you can do in tokens, the way you're distributing you know, for the basic example, when people contribute to your project, you want to issue them shares every single day. You know, why that doesn't actually happen in our traditional economies is because that would require you to issue new paperwork, issuing new shares, bring in lawyers, sign a bunch of paperwork, probably get board approval. And it's a huge nightmare to redistribute shares like that and do a new stock offering, etc. So it just becomes prohibitively expensive for you to actually account for all those contributions and start issuing stock. So that's kind of why companies do the stock options and things they have is because of the, how expensive it is legally to do it otherwise. Um, so that's one of the really cool things with using tokens is we can start doing the stuff we actually want to do um, and start using tokens to mediate it. Travel and movement, you know, tokens are a tool that allows us to swap contributions for one project to talk, enter and access another project by swapping tokens between them, right? Uh, it helps us govern access to say like, hey, you need these tokens in order to be part of this community. So it helps us set those boundaries of who is in and who is out of our community based on them holding this token. So it helps us you know, control access. Um, it helps us <laughs> scale coordination. So if we have more knowledge about who's contributing where throughout our whole movement, and we can start coordinating projects, efforts by aligning tokens, distributing tokens, all that stuff. So anyway, it helps us scale coordination across our movements. If each one of our projects starts having tokens, we can start doing stuff with. You can trade within your community with tokens. You can start doing equitable contribution accounting, which is what I keep talking about, You know, actually seeing people for who's bringing what to your project, right? Um, and then bridges and boundaries. So it helps us interact with the fiat world. So if your token is exchangeable for Bitcoin, for example, now you have a bridge from your community to Bitcoin. So you have a bridge there. And any bridge that you create with any other communities, you can do so using tokens to connect with those other economies. Um, that also creates the boundary between one economy. You know, the, the boundary between the Bitcoin economy and the Ethereum economy is what tokens you're holding, right? And you can trade those tokens between each other. Um, the final piece here is, you know, redirect speculation. I think this is what gets most people most excited because they're like, hey, you know, tokens, people speculate on them. There's a lot of value there. You know, what does Bitcoin do? It does absolutely nothing, but somehow it's been able to, you know, put $10 billion towards electricity fees every year. Like, wow, it was able to redirect speculation towards $10 billion in electricity. Like, that's incredible. What else could we redirect speculation to do? Um, so we just talk about it specifically for what it is, not giving it a bad or good name or whatever. Um, so these are really powerful powers. So this is what tokens allow us to do. So why are we using tokens that can help us do those things? All right, now this one's gonna be a little bit more complicated. So I'll actually start next week with it too, but I'll just go over it one time because why not? So <laughs> what do tokens do? Tokens track. What we're asking at this particular you know, alliance, what are we trying to track? We're trying to track all the forms of capital and different ways that people are showing up. Right here is listed nine. Um, and you can see different ways that people might contribute to your project and different types of capital that maybe or maybe you weren't already acknowledging or recognizing before. So when we're using tokens, we can start saying, hey, if people are showing up in these different capacities, we want to recognize them by giving them a token. All right, so here's a flow chart for designing your token to kind of help you figure out maybe what type of token model you might want to design. So there's two ways to start here, you know, one kind of at the bottom, one at the top. Right here, you see the structure styles. So these are different styles of communities that people have talked about. 
So for example, like Ubuntu is a like contributionism. It's a community contribution style of economy, you know, the Ubuntu type economy. So in this way, you can actually design that type of economy by coming to here and seeing what you need to connect it to to do that or an owner access, revenue sharing. And I'll explain what these are after I go through the flow, but let me just go through it. So first question you might wanna ask is, do you want your token to increase in value? Is this a token for speculation? Are you wanting people to buy it and think that the price might go up? Let's just call things what they are, or do you want it to stay stable? So you don't really design your token to decrease in value. Um, I'm not even gonna pretend like that's an option because if you do design your token to decrease in value, then you just have an incentive for no one to hold it, everyone to spend it and to get rid of it. So usually that means your token economy is gonna crash. So we don't design tokens to decrease in value. We either design them to increase in value or stay. Now, what do we mean by value? Because value is only relative to something else. So in this case, we're talking about relative to national currencies. That's what people think is valuable. So relative to a dollar, do you want your token to stay stable or do you want it to increase? So that's kind of your first question you're asking for your token. All right, if you're wanting to be stable, then you're probably wanting that to be like a currency in your community. If you don't like inflation, you don't like how that's harming you. Um, you want your community to be able to actually price things without getting stuck in the whole bull market, bear market of how currencies work, et cetera then cool, you want a stable currency, you come over here. Um, if you wanna be able to pay people in your project for the showing up, and this is how they you know, cash out to be able to pay for things like rent and food and the stuff they need to survive right now, then you can be able to create a, a currency that is stable to let's say fiat. And this is how Haifa issues tokens right now. You can create a dollar stable, euro stable, whatever you want token. And that token is then backed by your own assets and your own due. So your own DAO is gonna hold assets in it. Maybe it's holding, let's say Ethereum, for example, and it says, hey, we have $100,000 worth of Ethereum. So that means we have the ability to issue, let's say, oops, let's just get rid of this one. We have the ability to issue 50,000 of these tokens, which are always redeemable one for one for $1 worth of Ethereum in our treasury. So if that's the case for your token, then this token's worth a dollar, it's pretty stable to the dollar, and then you can use that within your economy. People treat it as good as a dollar because they can trade it for a dollar worth of assets, right? If you want it to be stable to buying power, then you can use constant seeds, and you can talk with the seeds community and the stuff we're building over there, and we can help you get a currency that is stable to purchasing power. So rather than fiat that's losing purchasing power, you know, seven to 10% every year, actually nowadays it's higher, um, you can have something that's actually stable within your economy and community to distribute value and exchange with, if you're using tokens, of course. So then what is it redeemable for in your community? It's redeemable for the products and services within your economy. So when people are buying this token, they're only buying it because they can redeem products and services with it. So this is like Disney bucks, for example. You know, it's kind of a, a fun token within your economy is, you know, how it could look. All right, so that's one side if you want it to be stable. The other side, if you're designing it to increase in value. So this is a, a form of investment or a form of community value that you wanna to grow together. So why it's always increasing is if we're regenerating land, land is always gonna be going up. So if you create a token that is you know, worth your land, we just designed to increase in value if we're being regenerative, right? Which is what our whole goal is. So that's why you might design it to increase. Cool. So. How do you want your token to increase in value? You know, how, does the, how do you determine what the value price of your token is? Does the market determine that? Meaning do you put your token on exchanges and then people buying and selling it is gonna determine what the price of your token is? Or do you do it asset-based where the price of your token is based on all the assets you have? And you can say, well, we've got a hundred million in land and it's been appraised at a hundred million, et cetera. And that's how, you know, how much value we're holding. Or do you do it protocol based? You know, protocol based is, uh, it's a lot of crypto projects are done this way. One main thing is, uh, and, uh, it's too, ex too complicated to explain this one. I'll explain it next week. The other one is policy based. <laughs> and policy based is that we just say, hey, this one's worth a dollar. Never mind, now it's worth a dollar 30. And you just agree to that as a community and you can manually change the price of your token that way. As long as your whole community agrees to those changes, then it's all good, right? So those are some of the ways that you might set the value of your token. And 
forgive me, I'll explain this one better next week. All right, so what is your token redeemable for to provide its value? So if you're saying this is what's determining the value, what's actually making that true, right? So this is when you might actually put in your project assets, i.e. the land, the buildings on your project, et cetera, which is one of the main ones. Or it might be project access. So you're saying, hey, you can stay a night here for every token that you have. So these tokens are redeemable for a night stay on our project or access to our restaurant or free food or whatever it is. You can get access to your project with this token, which provides it value, right? Or it could be revenue sharing which means holding this token, we're gonna say, hey, 10% of our profits or whatever it is this quarter is gonna go back to our token holders. So the more profits you generate as a project, the more value these tokens are holding, et cetera, you get it? Or it might be governance rights. So now your tokens are worth the value of making decisions in your community. So then it really depends on how valuable those decisions are is how valuable your token is, right? And this is how a lot of DeFi tokens also are is they're seen as governance tokens. But if the protocol itself has the ability to issue tokens and do a bunch of things that have a lot of value, then making decisions in the project itself is valuable. So governance rights become valuable depending on how valuable those decisions are, right? So these are things that can give your token value is they could be used to have a claim for assets. They can be used to give you access to a project. They could be used to give you some share of the revenue or they could be used to make decisions in your project. And that's kind of the base functions of a, a token in these economies. Okay, so I shared a lot. Is there any questions real quick before I try to wrap this up? <laughs> All right, bear with me. I know I deliver so much information every time, but you know, at least it can sit in this week and we'll dive into this more next week. Uh, can you uh, send a copy of this Reiki to us in, an e in the chat? Yep. I did it at the start. Let me just do it again real quick. Here it is. Okay, All right, thanks. so here's just a few example structure styles that I just came up with. Obviously, this isn't an you know, exclusive or exhaustive list. Um, but here, let me just go over a couple examples. So you might have a safety net slash contribution type of an economy, meaning people want to contribute, but they want to know that their contribution is worth something. I'm calling that a safety net. And what we're saying here is if the project fails and we put up a proposal to say the project failed, then we're going to sell all the assets. So we're just calling that like a safety net. So if people are earning these tokens, they know that if the project fails, then at least it's worth something that they're going to walk away with, right? So it's a safety net for people contributing to the project. It's kind of how that economy is seen. So how that works is then if a liquidation happens, then all the assets of the project are sold and then given to token holders. So if you have that function in your economy, then you kind of have that safety net option going on here. So that's what's driving demand for it, is that safety net. What drives supply for this is when new assets are added to the project. So let's say if that safety net was 100 million tokens because you had 100 million hectares of land, just simple math and then 50 million new hectares came in, then you issue 50 million more tokens that represent those new assets that the project now has. So the supply is being driven by new assets are acquired. So you create new tokens to acknowledge those new assets. And if you're also doing contributions, then you create new tokens to reciprocate new contributions. If those token contributions aren't being paid already through dollars or cash or, through exchange of goods or something else. So if you haven't already reciprocated those contributions, then you can do so with tokens, right? So that's one style. You can have a kin's domain, which this one is saying that, hey, we're gonna have the number of tokens that represent the entire value of the project. So 100 million hectares, we have 100 million tokens. And everyone who wants to steward one hectare, then you need to have, you need to earn a token by buying it or whatever. And then you lock that token. So you lock an equal percentage. So if you have 1% of the project, you acquire 1% of the tokens and you lock them. And then you just have access to that indefinitely. So that's kind of how that works. So you get project assets, assets, and if the whole thing fails, then it's liquidated and you're given the value back. And the only thing that creates new tokens under this scenario is when new assets are brought in. In this case, it's just new land. If you get new hectares, you make a new token that represents that hectare. So it's a really simple model. 
and you're saying, you know, earn the token or buy it, whatever that means to your project, probably helping it succeed or coming in with cash to buy the plot of land or whatever it is. And then they have access, access to the project, right? So that's another style. One could be community contributions. So this is, you know, under the Ubuntu contributionism or the one small town movement or so many communities that are saying like, hey, you know, work X number of hours a week for the community and that's going to earn you food, housing, stay, etc. Great. So how do these tokens work? Well, you need to have these tokens to have access, food, housing, stay, etc. How do new tokens be created when um, new access is created. So if you have tokens being created for staying a stay at the project, well, when you have more houses, then you have more capacity to issue more tokens because you have more houses that people can stay in. So new tokens are creating are created when new access is created or to reciprocate contributions and or, right? And so if you're doing that, you get to run that kind of economy. I'm just going to do a few more that are kind of interesting you know, debt and liabilities. So this is a common one for communities getting started where they're saying, hey, we're not giving shares of the project, we're giving out loans and we're gonna pay back the loans, right? So in this case, tokens are gonna be bought and reburned and burned over time. So part of the revenue of the project being generated is gonna be used to buy up old tokens. So old debt and to destroy those tokens. So pay back that old debt essentially. Right, and if you're holding old debt, then it's probably a really good idea to do it with a token that's stable. So you're not gonna be using an increasing value token to pay back debt because then your debt's just gonna keep growing and you don't want that. So you want your debt to be stable. So use a stable token, right? But then the people holding this debt, they wanna be able to make decisions. So they have governance rights for holding that debt. So they're the ones that are deciding whether the project is gonna live or die kind of, uh, if they're gonna get paid back or not. And then of course, if the project fails, all assets are sold and the liabilities are paid off first. So that debt liability model is kind of replicated here in tokens. You can have something just simple, a contribution accounting. The token does nothing else other than account for contributions. And this is what I'm actually suggesting everyone start with because this is the simplest way to start. Um, I'll highlight it one day. Um, I'll pause there. You guys can read these if, if they're not you know, obvious then you can ask me questions, but those are just some of the examples. So then in the meta story here, um, <clears throat> everything you're doing with tokens, you wanna maintain balance between them. So you wanna say, what's the demand for your token? You know, Why do people wanna buy or acquire or do stuff to earn this token? So you wanna have that soundly answered. And then you wanna balance that with the supply of how new tokens are being created. So that's how you're balancing your economy. As long as demand and supply are in balance, then the value of your token is going to remain constant. If demand increases above supply, then the value of your token is going to increase, et cetera. So that's the basics of token economics. Um, I'll pause there for some questions, and then we'll end for today, and we'll dive into exploring this more in depth next week. Um, Charles and then Robert. Uh, so I think that uh that this is sort of implicit in what you've been saying but i just wanted to check in uh the idea that a community might have many many different kinds of tokens serving different functions on this table uh in different ways so that uh uh for example if you were doing contribution accounting by uh 10 forms of capital why there's 10 independent uh, tokens with that are tracked uh, as different kinds. And then you might have an ownership token that's separate from those and you might have governance tokens. So a community could easily be managing 15 or 20 different token types under this model. Uh, and the only thing that scares me about that is, is that too much to load onto the community members to think of their their engagement with a community in that many different ways. But uh, yeah, yeah, just checking um, on that. Two ways to respond real quick. Please don't think of more than two tokens <laughs> to start off. So think of like one utility token for contribution accounting and then one payment token. That's what HIFA offers. And then also maybe a governance token. So sorry, three. And that's kind of the basic DAO tools is one for payments, one for tracking contributions that you couldn't pay for another way, and then one for tracking governance rights. And just start there. And then as you design and you know come to new needs that might require new tokens, then we can add that complexity later. 
Um, what Charles is sharing, which is really cool, is any of the projects that do use a do and use those tools. When anyone makes a contribution to your project, this is going to be a future feature that we're trying to roll out, but they track to what form of capital it was made. So if they donated land, then they're going to say this was for land natural capital. If they came in with money, then it was for financial capital. If they you know, did something culturally for the community, then it was for culture capital, et cetera. And then we have a protocol that's going to issue an equal number of tokens to the DAO for that capital. So we'll have natural capital tokens that are sent to the DAO or spiritual capital tokens that are sent to the DAO, right? And all this is going to do is then we're going to be able to look at our DAO and see all the different types of contributions that came into our DAO. And this will be cool for each one of our communities because then you can sort through the different communities and you can see where all the contributions are coming from. And you can be like, oh, this community, it's only had land contributions because maybe it's just getting started and now it just has land. You know, and you get a real quick snapshot of what's happening in the community, which is cool. So that's what tokens do is they help track things and bring things into our awareness so we can coordinate better. And that's one example of that coming into being. Um, Roberto. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and get kudos for all, get you, give you kudos for all that beautiful kind of tokenomics taxonomy. Uh, brilliant. Um, one question is uh, how much of that is actually um, already in the DAO tooling? Um, you can do any of these models using the DAO tools, as long as you find the right legal wrapper to justify what you're doing. So it depends on what jurisdiction you're in, of course. Um, but yeah, all of these are made possible. I only made examples of stuff we could do relatively easy today. Thanks. It's really just a difference of like why you're issuing tokens, who gets new tokens. It's kind of like when you remix those decisions and what tokens are used for, you can come up with all these different you know, styles, but you don't technically need to add any new features to be able to make it happen, right? Um, Will. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm curious how immutable the token minting can be. Um, if we agree that the tokens are immutable, what's stopping the DAO at a later date making a new decision and changing that? How do we really make sure that the tokens are immutable and the tokens that are given stay with the people they're given to? Um, that one's fairly easy. The contract that is running the token, you don't give permission to the DAO to change. So once you launch it, it's set. And that's what I was going to describe later. You know, under that model, it's the protocol based. So you can set an algorithmically determined token, i.e., Bitcoin is a protocol based token. It says under these conditions, we're going to mint new tokens. If those conditions are met, new tokens are minted, right? Um, you can set that up as a community and then walk away and say, these are our rules, they don't change. And that would be a protocol based, you know, minting structure. Um, I don't recommend that because that's like trying to ride a bicycle and to try to ride that you say, okay, we're gonna plan every step of the way of what's gonna happen going down the hill with this bicycle. We're gonna know that in two meters, we're gonna have to turn a half inch to the right. And then four feet after that, we're gonna have to make a slight degree to the left and like try to program it in advance. I think it's very difficult. And oftentimes you find out you made a mistake and you wish you could change it. So, <laughs> you know, I don't recommend getting rid of the ability to change your protocol unless it's really simple, really sound, and you know it's foolproof, then great, you know. Um, yeah, well, the main issue with, with it not being immutable is that investment capital that wants to come in will have a decision and a voice and a say in what goes on, because if they don't, they can lose all of their investment tokens. So we want to provide some sort of safety and security to the people that are bringing financial capital, but that's it. They, you know, they, they, that's it. They, don't, they want to be silent. And how do we actually make them silent? You know, so. Um, that's a really good question. I'm going to answer it because <laughs> I think we need to. But now we're understanding the complexity of all this and why it's impossible to just kind of like move in a straight path because we kind of have to figure all this out. But anyway, um, I'd say this belongs more in governance, but there's one way of working around this where you say there's two decision styles that could be made in your DAO. We don't have the features for this, but this is really alive in Haifa right now, so they're actually working on it but it's to be able to say there's different classes of decisions. So you can say a decision that's gonna affect the tokens, then it's governance tokens and those tokens that have to show up at the party to make a change there. So then later on, you could say the people who are holding all of the you know, investment yeah. tokens, 
they just can't have the contract changed without their permission, right? Yeah. So we can start getting really nuanced in governance there. I wanted to stay yeah. away from that rabbit hole until we get to the governance conversation. But yeah, that's an endless way of evolving it. Uh, before we go down those rabbit holes, uh, we first want to figure out what we're trying to do before we start designing our you know, governance to make sure that happens the way we want it to, right? Um, so I, I don't think we need to answer those questions yet. Let's first just find out what we want our token to do before we figure out how to design the you know, legal container yeah. around it, and then later on how to design our governance around that. Um, trying to do yeah. Which is a, okay. a journey that we're on, guys. <laughs> Yeah, and I like I like your thinking and your answer to that question because it's like you say a question high for asking and it's an important question. Um, my last question, just to close out, I know you want to finish up as well. Um, Twelve of the thirteen projects have confirmed. We haven't heard back from Mark Angelo and Valhalla, so they haven't said yes. I'm showing up. I'm representing. Thank you for voting us in. Um, the whole point of this exercise was to make sure we have thirteen. So at what point do we decide? Okay, we haven't heard from Mark Angelo and, and Valhalla. So they're not participating. Can we make an invitation to another project? And if so, I, I know who I would like to invite. And how do we make a decision? These are my questions. Um, this is why we need an active do to make policy changes like this, right? So um, in, in lieu of an active do, we can go off a general consensus and we can put up a poll in Discord and kind of go off of that the same way we've been doing everything up until now. So I would say put up a poll and say, do we want to remove this if we haven't been able to get in contact with them for, you know, X more longer? And then Maybe one more week. Yeah. Maybe everyone in this call, if anyone knows Mark Angelo, if anyone's connected to Valhalla, please reach out and say there's one more week to say you're participating. And if you're not, then, then we need to refill that space. That's step one, maybe. Propose that. Yeah. 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 Cool. Thank Thanks, you. Well. And much love to everyone. Thank you for showing up again. See you, see you guys next week. Uh, John. I'm just going to say what Warren just put in the chat. My understanding was that we were, you know, uh, going with 12. Um, and we, because, because of the way the voting turned out, there was such a close, you know, between 10, 11, 12, and 13, um, that we decided to include 13. So I would just say, somebody drops out, we're back to 12. That's good with me. Yeah, I'm a big fan of doing it that way too, so that we're not adding a new project halfway through the accelerator. And I've personally made a bunch of <laughs> pictures I don't want to update to add a different project. Um, so yeah, but anyway, let's put up a proposal and have that will be one of the options that we could vote on then. Um, any other thoughts, questions, anything to share before we end today? This was super helpful, thank you. I mean, even just seeing the visuals and knowing all the different kinds of structures, um, I kind of wish I hadn't done the presentation and asked the questions first, because that would have helped us think through how we set it up, so thank you. You are welcome. Uh, and I'm glad that it is helpful because sometimes I get nervous on being too complex here. And <laughs> So thank you and thank you for that feedback. Um, well, feel free to unmute yourselves and make any goodbye noises that you would like to. And I will see you all throughout the week and next week. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hey, Bye -bye. Walter, Walter, Susan said she wanted to meet with me right after this. Um, could you have her send me an email and I'll I'll circle back with her? Okay. She still Bye, guys. Love y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.